what does your salvation mean to you? I think a lot of times when we think about salvation, we think about the past. There was a time when we were lost, but we acknowledged our lostness, put our faith in Christ, and so we are saved. That, that is something that took place in the past. And then we think about the future. There's a day coming when I will not go to hell, I will go to heaven. Very few people, I would say, think about salvation in the present tense. That is, what does salvation do for me now? I was lost, now I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, but what about now? Uh, what role does salvation play now? What does salvation do for you in time right now? Put another way, what did salvation, your salvation, do for you last week? I want you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and we're going to read verses 10 through 12. And while this does not constitute a paragraph, it kind of picks up in the middle. Uh, and, and Peter has been talking about salvation. And I want you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word and look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Father, we pray now that you will bless the reading and the preaching of your word. Help us to receive it. Help us to understand better who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ and Father, we pray that your spirit would not be limited, quenched in any way in this service. Forgive us of our sins in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you and you may be seated. I cannot think of a greater subject upon which to contemplate, think, study, consider, and preach than the matter of salvation. In fact, the, the word salvation just simply means to be delivered. Now, what have you been delivered from? If you've been saved, what is it that you have been delivered from? Well, may, may, I, may I very kindly say to you today that we have been delivered from our sin, all of its penalty, all of its degradation and its condemnation. We have been set free from all of that in Jesus Christ. We have been saved from ourselves. Peter is writing to people that are suffering and, and they're, they're uh, hurting and they're confused and they don't understand. So why does he bring them back to salvation? He's already mentioned it in verse 2 and then in verse 9 and now in our text today, he is focused on salvation. These people are already saved. His purpose is not evangelistic. His purpose is to encourage. So why does he keep bringing them back to their salvation. May I submit to you this morning that it is this reality that we are saved that allows us to endure the hardness of life. It is the reality that we have been washed in the blood of Christ that allows us to go on living for the Lord Jesus. It is the reality that we belong to God, that we are in Jesus Christ. It is that truth that will not Allow us to quit, no matter how difficult things may be. Now you'll notice the movement of our text today. It is surrounded by, by three truths concerning this salvation. First of all, he says, the prophets, the prophets preached about this salvation. you notice it in verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. This so great salvation is the subject of Old Testament prophecy. Now, in your Bible, as you well know, there is an Old Testament, there is a New Testament. Some would have us to, to believe that, well, the Old Testament is about the Jews and the New Testament is about the church. I would say to you this morning that the Old Testament and the New Testament both are about the new life in Jesus Christ. 
You see, there was not a, a way for the Old Testament saints to be saved and then a way for New Testament believers to be saved. We are all saved alike and God has only had one plan of salvation and that plan of salvation has always been by grace through faith. There is never one time found in all of the Bible a works-oriented plan of salvation. Man would have us to believe that we have to do something. God says it has already been done. Man would have us to believe that we have to try to work our way to God. God says trust and you will be saved. There's not, not multiple ways of salvation. Now I know we live in a pluralistic society today. I understand that. But I'm telling you, when it comes to the matter of salvation, there is no room for pluralism. There is but one way of salvation, and you either accept that one way of salvation or you reject it. Right. Now these prophets, the Bible says, they, they have inquired and they have searched. And all through the Old Testament, the prophets are giving us a, giving us a snapshot. They're giving us a snippet. They're giving us a little bit of insight into the matter of salvation. While, while they didn't understand everything they prophesied, what they didn't know is that God had a seed and that God had a plan and God had a way and that way would provide salvation to all who would believe. Notice that he says they have inquired. These prophets, they have inquired. They have searched diligently. This uh, involves the idea of uh, with intensity they have searched, with a sense of urgency they have searched. The, the, the word searched was used of a dog on the scent of its prey. It was used of a lion as it was smelling the scent of its prey. They have searched. They have longingly looked for this way of salvation. Now, all through the Old Testament, the prophets talked about this salvation. They used types. They used shadows to convey the concept of salvation. I believe that the whole... Uh, whole concept of animal sacrifices, which, by the way, did not pay for anybody's sin. But so why did they have it? God was conditioning their minds so that they would be open and accept His plan of penal substitution. An animal's taking your place. An animal is shedding its blood for you. And all of that was preparing the heart and the mind of the Jews for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ who would lay down His life on the cross and pay for their sins. They knew that in the economy of God that God allowed for a substitute. And our substitute is the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament it is typified by a brazen serpent on a pole. And anybody that would look they would live. In the Old Testament is typified by water coming up out of a rock. If they would drink, they would live. The prophets told us about the coming of the Son of God. But notice in verse 11, he says, uh, in, in verse 11 again, he says, they have prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. I think there's a great error today among those who seriously study the Bible who say that the Old Testament is about works, the New Testament is about grace. Dear friend, all through the Bible it's about grace. It's all about grace. What do you think that was when, I, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden and God made uh, loincloths to cover them? He killed a blood, uh, an animal. The blood of an animal was given and God covered our first parents. He didn't kill them immediately. He covered them. That, my friend, was an act of grace. When God set those angels with flaming swords 
to protect the Garden of Eden lest they should eat of the tree of life and forever live in their sin. That was an act of grace when God came to Abraham in the land of the Ur of the Chaldees, a pagan culture, and God called him out. That was an act of God's grace when God came upon Rahab the harlot and extended to him his grace. What about, what about Ruth who was a Gentile and yet God included her? That was grace. All through the Bible, God deals with his people through grace. And he says these prophets testified of this grace. And he says in verse 11, The Spirit which was in them did signify of the sufferings of Christ and the glory should follow. I want you to look at this verse. If you mark in your Bible, mark these two words. In the latter part of verse 11, mark the word sufferings and then the word glory. Sufferings and glory. I can't think of any context in which those two words are used today. Suffering and glory. If you were a Jew, when Peter was writing this, you probably would have had the idea in mind that these two words do not go together when they are applied to the Messiah. He can't be a suffering Messiah and a glorious Messiah at the same time. Our Messiah will not suffer. Our Messiah will have might and glory and power. He will rule and reign. But suffer that, that did not enter into their mind that their Messiah, their Savior could ever suffer. And yet the prophet said that the Messiah will be a suffering Messiah. Notice it's interesting to note that the word sufferings is in the plural. He doesn't say the suffering of Christ, but rather he says the sufferings of Christ. Our minds are immediately ignited by the recognition of the plural, by the sufferings of Christ. Now don't forget Peter's writing to people who are suffering they're not suffering because they're lawbreakers. They're not suffering because rebellion is bound up in their heart. They're suffering because they are trying to live for Christ. And Peter says, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're suffering for Christ? There, there were multitude uh, facets of the sufferings of Christ. Think about the physical sufferings of our Lord. Tongue cannot describe, pen cannot detail the sufferings, the physical sufferings of our Lord as he was beaten, as he was slapped, as he was crucified. It defies the mind of men to drink in all that is involved in the physical sufferings of our Lord. I watched this last week, a documentary on Auschwitz. What was done to thousands of Jews. And I thought as I watched that, my God, how, how in the name of God can anybody suffer the way those people suffered? to see their emaciated bodies, to hear the horrid details of what they did to little children in those camps. It defies the minds of men. How could a human being do that to another human being? But dear friend, let me say to you, as horrific as that is, it is nothing compared to the physical sufferings of the Lord Jesus at the cross. Nothing. But not only was our, did our Lord suffer physically, our Lord suffered emotionally. The Bible says that He came to His own and His own received Him not. That is, He came to His own creation and His own people, the Jews, rejected Him and received Him not. There was emotional suffering. You, you read about the tears of Jesus when He was here in the flesh on earth. There was spiritual suffering. Some say, I don't, I don't believe Jesus suffered spiritually. Friend, I'm telling you this morning that if Jesus did not endure suffering in the realm of the Spirit, there is no salvation available to us today. 
our Lord suffered spiritually. What else does it mean when he cried and wrapped his uh, tongue around those painful childhood words? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Our Lord suffered spiritually. The sufferings of our Lord, but now wait a minute. Not only did the prophets talk about the sufferings of the Lord, they also talked about the glory of the Lord. Perhaps when Peter wrote these words, he was thinking about Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? All we like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We looked upon his visage. We were offended at the way he looked. We were offended at the depths of his gruesome death. Then he goes from the sufferings to the glory. I don't think the glory can be confined to one action. It is not just merely the resurrection, though it is included. It is not merely the ascension, though it is included. It is not merely the session of Christ, though it is included. What is the glory of Christ to which Peter refers? I think it is the victorious resurrection of Christ. It is the ascension back into the heavens. It is when our Lord sat down at the right hand of God. It is all, all of that rolled into one. Jesus went from suffering back to glory. And he's seated at the right hand of God. Why does Peter mention that? Because the sufferings of Christ were limited. The sufferings of Christ took place within a narrow window of time. But his glory, that is forever. Here's why Peter's writing this to us we suffer, we're misunderstood. Our faith is construed by the world. We're ridiculed because we name the name of Christ. And Peter says to them and to us, your suffering is taking place in a narrow window of time, but your glory that you will share in with Jesus is forever. It's worth it. It's worth it. Whatever suffering you endure for the cause of Christ, whatever ridicule may come your way, it is worth it because of the glory that is to come. But you know, that doesn't fit our mindset today. Our mindset today is, if I'm going to have glory, I want it now. We're we're impatient. If we know we're going to have something, just go ahead and give it to me. Let me have it now. And the Lord says, no, by the way, in the economy of God, the cross always comes before the crown. There's always suffering before there is a crown. And Peter says, this is what the prophets spoke of. This is what they prophesied of. But not only does he say, not only does he say that the prophets prophesied of this great salvation. But now notice, secondly, and I've got to hurry, and that is that the apostles preached it. You see, there is a seamless thread all through the Bible. When the apostles come on the scene, they they do not concoct a new gospel. When the apostles come on the scene, they do not devise a new message. Their message was the message of the prophets. It had added light to it. It had more details to it. But it was exactly the same message. Look at verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not to themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you. He says the things which are now reported unto you by them. That is, Peter and the apostles, those who had the complete and the full picture of Christ, they had been evangelized. The good news had been brought to them. And notice notice that Peter says that it was by the Holy Spirit of God. I don't mean any disrespect, but sometimes people are afraid of the Holy Spirit. I I think, and I know this is a, a hyperbolic statement, but I, I think some of us have the mistaken idea that, that if we really get involved in the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, it'll, it'll make us to live uncontrollably. 
well, living in control is not working too well, is it? It'll make us bark like dogs and bray like mules. Friends, that's not what the Holy Spirit's about. What I'm telling you is you cannot be saved apart from the work of the Holy Spirit of God. I, I cannot preach effectively and powerfully apart from the Holy Spirit of God. I cannot understand this book. It doesn't matter how, how hard I study it, how many books I read about the Bible. It requires the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit of God. And, and Peter says the apostles preached. They were illumined by the Holy Spirit of God. They were energized by the Holy Spirit of God. So Peter says this salvation, this seamless thread through the Bible, first of all, was, was prophesied by the prophets. It was preached by the apostles, but now notice the last thing, and that is, it is pondered by the angels. This great salvation is pondered by the angels. And by the way, angels are real beings. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean they're not real. Angels rejoiced at the creation. Angels saw Lucifer in all of his beauty and glory as rebellion welled up in his heart and he rebelled against God and was cast out of heaven as lightning. They saw all of that. But there's some things that angels do not know. Dear friend, angels don't know everything. There is only one being who is omniscient and that is God. Satan is not. Angels are not. They don't know everything. Let me tell you one thing angels do not know. They do not know the joy that Christ's salvation brings. They are non-redeemable beings. But here Peter says these angels, they wonder about salvation. They are vitally interested in all that God is doing on the earth. But there's something quizzical about this work of salvation that angels do not know. He said the angels desire to look into. It is a strong, continual craving that angels desire to know more. They have a holy curiosity when it comes to salvation. I think it is Hunt who painted a picture of an angel in heaven. And he's holding a crown of thorns. And one finger is on the tip of a thorn. And he has a quizzical look. What can this mean? What is this all about? The angels desire. They, they are seeking. They are searching. They are looking into this matter of salvation. Why? They know nothing about it. But we do. We know something about salvation. What we know is that before our salvation we were lost. What we know is that someday we're not going to hell, we're going to heaven. But what about now? Here's Peter's point of these verses. The point, the focus, the impact is this. Whatever you suffer here, do not lose sight of the glory that will be revealed there. In other words, yeah, we're going to get hurt. We're going to be disappointed, devastated perhaps. Things are not always going to go well. No matter how faithful you live for Christ, it's not always going to work out. There's going to be pain and suffering and sorrow. How do you get past all of that? You get past all of that by living under the all-encompassing cloud of the glory of your salvation. It's temporary. The glory is eternal. Can you live that way this week? No matter what happens, can you live that way? Yeah, this is inconvenient, but the glory is eternal. This is temporary, but the glory is forever. The only way anybody has ever been saved is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus. That means that you can be saved. As we sang a while ago, grace is greater than our sin. It matters not what you have in your past. It matters not what you've done or how many times you've done it or where you've done it. What matters is that God's grace 
is greater than your sin. And you can be saved today. You've got to acknowledge your sin. Put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus. If the Holy Spirit today is making you aware of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come, believe on the Lord. Be saved today. Let's stand together and bow our heads as we make ready for our invitation. It may be this morning that you've been living in such a way that you feel like your circumstances will never end. Friend, they're temporary. The glory is forever. Live in light of the glory. Don't live in light of the present circumstances. Live in light of what is to come when we rule and reign with Jesus Christ and share in His glory. Father, we pray that you'll use the message now for your glory. May we be ever mindful of what we have in Christ and who we are in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.